The Buddha's Four Foundations of Mindfulness When we read the suttas, we should remember that they were never meant to be read on their own. They were part of a community, the inherited knowledge of the community. In the early days, you would hear a sutta and then you could ask the person reciting it, what does this mean? What does that mean? He could fill in the blanks. This personal interaction would play a necessary role because often there are quite a few blanks. You see this especially in the Buddha's instructions on breath meditation. They're his most complete set of meditation instructions, 16 steps in all, and yet they leave a lot of questions unanswered. So we have to look around, read some passages in the context of other suttas, try to make sense out of them, and talk them over with people who have practiced to gain a sense of what the passages might be getting at. The first big question is, are the 16 steps meant to be read and practiced in line, in other words, 1 through 16, and the indication seems to be no? All four tetrads at once. They fall into four sets of four called tetrads. The first tetrad has to do directly with the breath. The second tetrad has to do with feelings, the third with the mind, and the fourth with dhammas. It's not the case that you're going to focus on the body and only when the body is all taken care of will you focus on feelings, and then wait until the feelings are all taken care before you focus on the mind and then the dhammas. Actually, all four tetrads are present right from the start. The sutta itself, where the Buddha gives the most detailed explanation of these steps, indicates as much. It says that when you pay attention to the breath, the act of paying attention generates a feeling, or is a feeling, the text says, but basically the act of attention helps to fabricate a feeling, what's called a feeling not of the flesh. As for the mind, it says that there's no mindfulness of breathing without mindfulness and alertness. And as for damas, qualities, you have to develop a quality of equanimity to put aside all your worldly concerns right from the beginning. So even as you're first settling in with the breath, you've got all four aspects right there. You can read the different tetrads as alternative instructions as to what to do as you get started. First, you analyze the problem. You're trying to settle down and the mind's not settling down. Is it a problem with the breath? Is it a problem with the feelings, the mind, or outside things coming in? Once you've identified the problem, then you can look at the appropriate tetrad to see what you might be doing wrong and what you can change. The first tetrad has to do directly with the breath. For example, with the first tetrad, the first two steps are to breathe in long and out long, breathe in short and out short. The next two steps are trainings. You train yourself to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in and out, and then you train yourself to breathe in and out calming bodily fabrication. In other words, the intentional element of the breath, or the in and out breath itself. This last step can take you all the way to the fourth jhana. Another sutta confirms this, saying that when the bodily fabrication is fully calmed, that's where you're going to be, fourth jhana. That's a very brief outline in how you deal with the breath. Actually, though, a lot more is going on. A John Lee fills in quite a few more details. When the Buddha says to be aware of long breathing and short breathing, you can expand that. You can include deep or shallow, heavy or light, fast or slow. And because you know from the second tetrad that you'll be trying to develop a sense of fullness or refreshment and pleasure with the breath, you can use the variations of the breath to help induce that sense of pleasure. Then you're aware of the whole body as you breathe in. You train yourself at this point. This is something you have to get good at. A lot of people have trouble with this. They're focused on one spot, then they try to be aware of the whole body and very quickly find themselves back at one spot again. 
It takes a while to back into the sense of awareness that's filling the body all the time. Actually, you've already got a spotlight awareness and a background awareness. What you're trying to do is bring your background awareness up to the fore. As for calming bodily fabrication, we learn elsewhere that before you calm things down, you should energize them. Otherwise, you can put yourself to sleep. So first breathe in a way that's energizing and then allow things to relax. As your focus gets stronger and more consistent, you can stay with calmer breathing and not lose focus. If you find, though, that the breath gets so gentle that you can't keep track of it, you have to breathe a little bit more heavily again. That's the breath side of things. The second tetrad has to do with feelings. Then there's the feeling side. You breathe in and out, training yourself to be sensitive to rapture. In other words, there are potentials for rapture or refreshment in the body. Wherever there's a sense of fullness in the body, allow that sense of fullness to stay. This can just be the sense that it's full of blood or full of energy. There's a nice buzz, say, in your hands or in the middle of the chest. Allow that nice feeling to be unaffected by the in and out breathing. Don't squeeze it. That way it gets a chance to grow stronger. Even as you breathe out, allow this feeling to stay full. As it grows stronger, let it spread. It's usually accompanied by pleasure. Sometimes, though, the pleasure and the refreshment are two different things. After a while, the sense of refreshment or energy spreading gets to be a little bit too much. So you figure out how to tune in to a subtler level of energy that's just pleasant and you let the excess go out your eyes, out the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. The third with the mind. The next step is to be sensitive to mental fabrications, which are feelings and perceptions. The step after that is to calm mental fabrications. This is where perceptions play a big role. You want to find perceptions that will create calmer feelings because you're going to go from rapture down to pleasure and then ultimately to equanimity. What kind of perceptions help with that? A John Lee recommends perceiving the whole body as saturated with breath energy flowing in different parts of the body. In some cases, it flows up. In some cases, it flows down or circles around. So what way of perceiving the breathing would be most helpful right now to get things to calm down? When mental fabrication is totally calm, that can take you all the way through the formless chanas. Here again, we see how the different tetrads are not lined up in a row. The first tetrad delivers you to the fourth jhana, but then the second tetrad starts way back with the first jhana, trying to develop a sense of rapture before taking you up to the fourth jhana and into the formless ones. So the two tetrads are best developed in parallel. The third tetrad follows a similar principle. It starts with being sensitive to the mind. If you haven't been sensitive to the mind up to this point, you're not going to get anywhere. As the Buddha said, the mind is right there all along. It has to be mindful and alert for you to stay with the breath from the very beginning. But sometimes the mind is the problem. So you look at it. You get sensitive to the state of the mind and then you notice. Does it need to be gladdened and energized? Okay. Breathe in a way that gives it more energy. Breathe in a way that gives it a greater sense of rapture and well-being. Sometimes to gladden the mind, you have to drop the breath and go to another theme that you find inspiring. Does the mind need to be more concentrated? Do what you can to get things really focused. Does it need to be released from its burdens? These are the different steps you follow in the third tetrad. In other words, you read your mind and then you energize it, then you steady and concentrate it, and then you release it. Those steps do follow in a logical order, but sometimes you have to jump around a little bit. You might have to steady things before you energize them. 
So this tetrad, too, starts at the very beginning and delivers you up through the jhanas and on through the various levels of release. The release here starts with what's called awareness release, the act of letting go of sensuality or sensual thoughts for the time being, letting go of any other unskillful qualities for the time being, or letting go of the factors of a lower state of concentration as you're trying to get into a higher one. It can also, though, go on to total release, which is what you want in the area of the mind. You want bodily fabrication to be calmed. You want mental fabrication to be calmed, but you especially want the mind to be released. And the fourth with Damas. The fourth tetrad gives you some idea of how to do that. First, you start with inconstancy. You notice how things arise and pass away. In the Buddha's descriptions of arising and passing away, he always notes that your knowledge has to be penetrative. In other words, you don't just see things coming and going. You also want to look into the mind to see why they come, why they go. And when they come, are they good? Are they the kind of things you want to encourage or not? That's what it means for knowledge to be penetrative. In the very beginning, the main focus is on the inconstancy of the things that are distracting you. The Buddha himself relates this particular tetrad to the task of putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. And when he taught Rahula breath meditation, even before he started with the first step, he had him contemplate various themes, one of which was inconstancy. This is where you use it. Suppose you suddenly think of something that happened years back. You have to remind yourself, that's gone. Or if you think of something you're anticipating in the future, remind yourself that even if it comes, it's going to go too. We've been searching for happiness in things that change, change, change all the time. Isn't it time to look for something more reliable? Thinking in this way, you develop a sense of dispassion for the distraction, and it stops. When it stops, you put everything down. In other words, you don't have to keep thinking about how great it was that you were able to put that down. You put it down and then you get back to work. So those are the steps in the last tetrad. Focus on inconstancy, then on dispassion, then on cessation, then on letting go. As the concentration gets deeper, as you're going from one level of concentration to another, you want to see the factors that you're dropping as inconstant, not worthy of passion, so that you can put them down. Then when the concentration is solid, you begin to notice that even it has its inconstancy. There are risings and fallings in the level of stress. So you look into them. What in the mind is causing them? Why does the stress go up? Why does it go down? You see what's causing it to go up and you realize you don't need that. You develop dispassion for it. And because your passion was driving it, dispassion makes it stop. Then you put everything down, including the insights that made things stop. This is the kind of analysis that ultimately can set you free. So the four tetrads are not to be lined up in a row, one after the other. They're to be lined up side by side. They're like a map with four pages. You unfold it and there are four sections. And it's good to have the map in the back of your mind. Don't put it in the front of your mind while you're meditating. That would be like trying to go through a forest looking at nothing but the map as you follow along the trail. You're going to run into trees. You're going to run into stumps. You're going to get bitten by a snake. Ideally, you first look at the map to get a sense of the general direction. Then you put it down and focus on the trail itself. In other words, you have the map of breath meditation in the back of your mind, but you've got the breath in the forefront. And you realize that there are feelings right here. There are mind states right here. There are dhammas right here. You're trying to get them together in a way that's calm and clear. Use this map to figure out what's lacking, what needs to be added. This presence of mind with the breath right here. That's what it's all about. The map is there to give you an idea of how many facets there are to what you're doing right here. 
right now, because that's an important part of meditation. You commit to the meditation, but you also reflect on what you're doing. You realize that you're here not just to be with the object, but also to look at the mind as it relates to the object, because that's even more fascinating than the object. The breath does have lots of interesting details, especially in the workings of breath energy in the body. But the way the mind relates to objects is even more fascinating. The way it falls for its feelings and perceptions is even more interesting. The way it relates to itself is interesting. You want to be aware of all these facets because only then does your vision becomes all around. We're students of the Buddha who was said to have an all-around eye. He saw things from all angles, reflected on things from all sides. That was what enabled him to find a release that was total, release all around. As he said, his mind was released everywhere. That's our teacher. So as we try to follow him, let's see if we can make our own awareness all around and released everywhere too. Savor your breath right here, right now. To really enjoy the breath meditation, you have to learn how to savor your breath. There are different ways you can do that, as there are with savoring a sensual pleasure, such as fine food or beautiful music. Part of the skill of savoring is putting yourself in a receptive mood, part of it is how you talk to yourself, and part of it is opening yourself up physically, especially if it's listening to music, opening yourself up to the effect it can have on you. The same principles apply with the breath. First, remind yourself that this is the force of life that you're watching. It only stands to reason that if it feels good inside, it's going to be good for you. It'll give you energy, soothe the nerves, nourish the muscles that have been overworked. It can do a lot of good. Then try to make yourself receptive. Try to notice which parts of the body are most sensitive to how an in-breath feels or how an out-breath feels, but particularly the in-breath. If you're not sure, hold the breath for a bit until you feel you've got to breathe. Then as the breath comes in, you'll notice certain parts of the body feel greatly relieved. Those are the parts you should focus on. Those are your sensitive parts. For some people, the most sensitive spot is in the chest, in the area around the heart, or it could be behind your eyes, in the middle of the head, or in the throat. So explore for a while where your spots are. Pay special attention to the in-breath, because that's the energizing breath. The in-breath is something you do. The out-breath is something you should learn how not to squeeze out. You do the in-breathing. The body will allow the breath back out again at its own pace. Then, when you feel the need to breathe in again, then breathe in. Sometimes it's good to try to regulate the rhythm. They've done research showing that a rhythm in which you take five or six seconds for the in-breath, five or six seconds for the out-breath, and try to keep it regular like that for a while can be extremely calming. When you have trouble maintaining a full five-second breath, ask yourself, which parts of the body are tight or tensing up, preventing the breath from coming in that long? Try to relax them. Also, try to get out of your head and into your body. Remind yourself that consciousness is there in all the parts of the body. Ajahn Suwat made the comment one time that you could take an iron stake and stick it into any part of the body, and you'd know that there's pain. Suppose the spike is in the leg. It's not as if the awareness up in the middle of the head has to go running down to the leg to let you know there's pain. Your awareness in the leg lets you know right away. Have a sense that you inhabit the whole body and you're right there with the different parts of the body that are sensitive to the breath, especially if it's the area around the eyes or behind the eyes. This is an area where, when we think a lot in the course of the day, the blood gets pushed around quite a bit. So if you allow it to just stay still around that area, the blood can flow in with a sense of fullness, comfortable fullness. It doesn't feel tight or overstuffed. Then, as it's full, the breath comes in and nourishes that part of the body. It feels good, feels gratifying. 
So you learn how to talk to yourself about the breath. You also learn how to tune in to the parts of the body that are sensitive to the breath and open yourself up to them. This way, the meditation becomes something that's not just in your head. It's down there in your body, the whole body, and it provides you with a place you can settle in. From then on, it's just a matter of modulating things so that they feel just right. Sometimes a rhythm feels good for a while and then not so good. Well, you can change. It's entirely up to you. This is one of the areas of meditation where your preferences actually play a large role. What kind of breathing do you like? Do you like long breathing, short breathing, fast, slow, heavy, light, deep, shallow? There are lots of variations, and you can think of the breath energy doing different things in the body, coming up from the soles of the feet, up through the legs, giving support to the spine, or going down from the top of the head. The Zen master Hakuin recommended having an image of a big ball of butter on top of your head. As you breathe in, think of the butter melting and going down, down, down the body. So play with the breath. Play with your perceptions around the breath. Play with all the different kinds of fabrication that go into making up your sense of the present right here, right now. It's in playing with them that you get to know them. It's like learning how to play a guitar. You take the guitar into your room, you close the door, and you pluck at it. You discover a few things that sound nice, and you play around, and find some things that don't sound so nice. You drop those, you go back to the things that sound nice. But then you start experimenting, exploring, bringing in some ingenuity, but also learning how to be sensitive. With a guitar, what sounds good to you? What harmonies hit a soft spot in your body or mind? Name and form. With the breath, what feels good to you as you breathe in? You want to get sensitive to this because you're going to be getting sensitive to what the Buddha calls name and form. Name covers all the different activities of the mind. Form, of course, is the form of the body as composed of the properties of earth, water, wind, and fire. You want to learn to be sensitive to these things on those terms, because those are the very basic terms of discernment, things as they're directly experienced. Discernment is not a matter of imposing somebody else's ideas on your mind, telling yourself, they say you have to see things as inconstant, stressful, not self. Okay, where's the inconstancy? Then you make yourself come to the conclusion, oh yeah, it's true what they say. Coming to that kind of conclusion is not what the Buddha wants. He uses those terms, but he uses other terms as well, for getting a sense of what's going on and how you're building things out of the raw materials of name and form, and how it's just not good enough. You find things that are good for a while. In fact, you're encouraged to do this. As a John Lee says, you take what's inconstant and you try to make it constant. You take what's stressful and you try to make it pleasurable. You take what's not self and you try to get it under your control as much as possible. See how far you can go in that direction. It's only when you push up against the three perceptions like this that you find the point where they push back. And where will you find that? In your own sensitivity, your value judgment, the choice to hold on or to let go is also made in your own sensitivity. No one's forcing you. But as you get more sensitive, you begin to see that there are certain things you've done or are doing that you used to like, but now you don't like them anymore. It's not satisfying anymore. You've found something better. This is why an important part of meditation is that it gives you something to rely on, something to fall back on. You're not simply asked to learn to get detached from everything and then let go. The Buddha gives you good things to hold on to first, so that you can let go with a sense of safety, and also a sense of being rewarded by letting go. As he says, letting go is for your long-term welfare and happiness. We're not here simply to see things as they are. One, because we're here to see things as they work. 
how cause and effect work. And two, we're seeing these things so that we can be more discerning in knowing which forms of happiness and pleasure really are satisfying. Nibbana is the ultimate pleasure, the ultimate happiness, the ultimate sukha, bliss, happiness, well-being. After all, Nibbana is the ultimate pleasure, the ultimate happiness, the ultimate sukha, bliss, happiness, well-being. You get to appreciate it first by learning how to appreciate what feels good right here, right now, in the body. So try to develop your sensitivity here. Learn how to savor what's pleasurable here, because that sensitivity will reorient you, give you new ideas about what happiness is, what well-being is, and what's needed to find it. It also opens you up to the potentials you have right here. Think about all the skills the Buddha found in his meditation, leading at last to the ultimate skill, which is the ending of the effluence. How are you going to know what an effluent is unless you get really sensitive to how things flow around in the heart and mind right here? So try to get sensitive right here in the heart, right here in the body. Explore your sensitivity. Savor what you find is good. That's how you develop your palate. That's how your discernment gets strong, strong enough to overcome a lot of the preconceived notions you bring to the breath. Bring to the body, bring to your own mind, bring to life. It's only when you find something you thoroughly like right here that you can change the way you rank pleasures in your life. Because this is a blameless happiness. It has a lot more potential than sensual pleasure. Learn how to savor the potential of well-being simply here in name and form as you've got them right here, right now.